subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello there. You're welcome to the Joy Learning channel. This is your senior high school R. I am pleased to bring you another mathematics experience. Thanks for choosing this channel. My name is Danso. If this is your first time, I'm glad you made it here. If you are one of our regulars, thank you for keeping faith. I hope you continue to enjoy it. Today's lesson is focused on one of the most important parts of mathematics. Here I talk about calculus. Today we shall be treating the first part of calculus. We shall be treating the foundational, or if you like, the fundamental principles of calculus. So then, at the end of this lesson, it is our hope that you'll be able to do a number of things. And these things you must do, and do them very, very well. They are critical to your success, as far as mathematics is concerned, especially if you intend to do a higher education, which I believe you want to. So, together, we should be able to define one of those fundamental principles called limits. You should be able to determine the limit of a given function. What is the limit? What is it all about? We'll get to explore it in a bit. Also, you should be able to determine what we call the derivatives of selected functions from first principles. What are first principles? What are derivatives? We'll also get to find out about these in a very short while. Thirdly, we should be able to determine the derivative of selected functions after we have determined them from their first principles. From the first principles, we will get general rules. From these general rules, we should be able to determine the derivatives of given functions. And then finally, we should be able to apply these rules of differentiation in determining different derivatives of functions. You would notice that in all of our objectives, certain words keep recurring. Words like derivatives, words like functions. These words are important and that's why they bear repetition. It is because the entire subject of calculus rests with these two things. And so, let us explore. What do we mean by calculus? What is calculus? Calculus is a Latin word. It really simply means a stone or something really small like a pebble. What has that got to do with math? It is because the ancient Romans and Greeks used the stone as, or stones as a means of calculating. You see where the word calculating. So they use it as a reckoning device. So for example, you are going to vote. If you are in Ghana and I can't speak it, we will say, Okotowa Abba. The Abba there will mean seed. In the Greek, Latin, Roman jurisdictions, it would have been calculia or stones. Something to represent what you stand for. So it was a rec reckoning device. So they were like stones, something small. Maybe the other reason for which it's called calculus is because it relates to change. And um, like every other field of study, chemistry, for example, you would want to understand things from their very, very basic component. For example, in chemistry, you deal with atomic particles, where you deal with protons, neutrons, electrons. If you were treating biology, you'll be interested in cell structure because it is the most basic unit of human existence or even of life. So you want to understand the cell structure of a plant, the cell structure of animals, etc., etc. So things like calculus will deal with little changes. We call them infinitesimals. It means they are very little, but those little changes helps us to understand bigger changes. Let me give you an illustration. Imagine a stone falling from a height, say 10 meters. Now, when the stone gets to the fifth meter in the air, would it have covered, would it be the same time it to cover as from the fifth mark down to the zero mark? So 10 to five, would it be the same time as 
5 to 0. Or let's say between 10 and 7.5, will it be the same thing as from 7.5 to 5? We try to understand those little differences. So we call calculus the arithmetic of change, and usually of little change. So we call them arithmetic of infinitesimals. All right. So it helps us to know the net effect of related parameters on an entire system. Now, this definition may not sound very standard, but it covers the whole idea of functions. So we'll deal with that in a short while. What are functions? What are functions? Functions are so ubiquitous. They are so widespread. You find them practically everywhere in mathematics because functions help us to determine or to explain phenomena in a very short mathematical way. For example, um, if I said the area of a circle is pi r squared. What I'm simply saying is that I can describe the entire region covered by a circle if I know a certain quantity called the radius. And um, there is a certain other quantity called pi. We shall talk about that in a short while. But if I understand these two things, I can explain the area of a circle or determine the area of any circle anytime, anywhere. So functions are important. What are functions? A function is a mathematical expression showing the relationship between and among interacting entities. And each input value must have exactly one unique output value. So the function could be anything from a polynomial to a trigonometric function to a logarithmic function. And oh boy, there are many, many different functions. So so long as we can use a mathematical expression equation to, to, to model anything, we call that thing a function. And it is critical because all of calculus rests with functions. All of calculus rests with functions. By the way, calculus comes in two parts. There is the part where we look for little differences, and there is a part where we look for the area covered by those little differences. So we call one of them differential calculus and the other one inferential calculus. So there, we first time we differentiate, the next time we integrate. So there's differential calculus, there's integral calculus. All right, so what are the kind of functions we have? We have polynomial functions, we could have trigonometric functions, and the polynomial functions could be algebraic like 5x cubed minus 4x plus 11, which might be describing a certain phenomenon. Well, in this case, I'm not too sure what phenomenon it describes. This is just an example. But like I mentioned earlier, there is a being equal to pi r squared. That is quite clear and straightforward. There's a trigonometric function. Oh, we're dealing with angles. So you hear things like sine and cosine and tangent and all the other variations of it like second, cosecant, cotangent, and even hyperbolic functions, well, which is beyond the scope of your senior high school curriculum. And then there's logarithmic function, which is also a kind of function, but you, we will not cover much of that. We would, I'll give you a bonus on this much later. So you could have things like 2 sine x plus tan x, which is trigonometric, and p of x being the natural log of 3x plus 4. Well, that thing you see there that looks like in is really ln, because it's natural log of 3x plus 4. So these are a few examples of functions. And like I said, all of calculus rests with functions and we're going to talk about derivatives in a bit. So let's talk about, first of all, the limits of a function. What do we mean by the limits of a function or the limits of functions? Well, look at the word limit. Limit means that there is a barrier, so to speak. There is a boundary. There is a limitation. There is how far or you can go or not go. So what, when we say the limit of a function, are we trying to restrict the function? Yes, precisely so. We're trying to restrict the function. So the limit of a function is the numerical value of the function as the input of the function approaches 
a certain value. So we are asking ourselves, when we are doing limits, we are asking, how far or what value will this function become or attain if the input function, remember when we define function, we said a function must have a unique output for every input. So there must be input, there must be output. Usually it's called a function machine. So think of it as um, you throwing stuff into your food mixer, blender as some people prefer to call it. And um, at the end of the day, after you've turned it on and it's off, you get something out of it. So the input could have been your fruits, it could have been your vegetables, it could have been any of those things. And when the mixer has done its work, then it turns out a smoothie or whatever you chose, a puree, that you wanted to get out of it. So that is what a function is. It must take an input, but it must also give you an output. So for a limit, we are asking ourselves, if we keep giving the input, the, the, the function, a certain input, what would the value become as it gets closer and closer to that input value? Let's explain it a little further. So let's say we have a function, a polynomial algebraic function, f of x as 5x cubed minus 4x plus 1. We had that function earlier. Say we have this function. Question is, what happens if this function is given an input value that is, say, a. Now, where a is just an arbitrary number, just any number. So if we put, say, 2 there, what would the whole function f of x, what would it return? What would be the output? Remember, it is the value that the function f of x approaches. It never really becomes it, but it gets very, very close to it. Why do we want to know that? It gives us an idea what, it's almost predictive, it's almost like predictive analytics. What we want to know, what it will look like, is almost trying to foretell, almost prophetic, right? Yeah, so we're trying to foretell what the outcome would be as we get closer and closer to our value input. So, we will read this as the limit of f of x as x tends to, or as x approaches a. Remember I said a is anything arbitrary. The arrow pointing rightward, we read it as tends to, or approaches. So we say the limit of f of x as x tends to a. Let's take that again. The limit of f of x, which is the function, as x, the input value, approaches or tends to or becomes a. So for example, if we replaced a with 2, we would say the limit of f of x as x approaches 2. In which case, Anywhere we see x in the function, we will substitute it with the number 2. And if we did that, 2 cubed would be 8. 8 by 5 would be 40. 40 plus 11 would be 51. And 51 minus 4 multiplied by 2, 8. 51 minus 8 will give us 43. In other words, this function f of x will become 43 if x becomes close enough. To 2. It will never become 43, but it will become very, very close to 43. So close to it, we could as well say it is 43. Well, there is a very nice name for it. We call that the asymptote. That is just for your learning. All right. Just something to, you know, remember. All right. So those are, those are, that's a limit. That is the concept of the limit. Why is it important in calculus? It is because, like I said, calculus deals with functions, and functions are a description of a phenomenon. And we want to be able to predict what the phenomenon would tend to. 
or become if we put in a certain value. So we put in arbitrary values to, f to find out what's going to happen. So what kind of functions, what kind of limits do we have? Well, we have as many different limits as there are functions. So if there are 30 functions, we have 30 different ways of finding the limits. But it's not really complicated. It's pretty straightforward. So let's look at a few examples. So let's say we have the limits of constants. We have the limits of functions with powers. And then we have limits of product of functions. These are three very quick examples. And I'll illustrate each of them pretty soon. So there's limits of constants. In other words, where the function is a constant. So if I said f of x is, for example, k, in which case k is a constant, then how do we find the limit of a constant? Because it is a function anyway. All right, so how do we find it? Quite simple. The limit of k as x tends to a will simply be k. Because you recall that when we have k, it is actually k x to the power 0. And so long as x is not 0, any other value exponent 0 should give us 1, so long as x is not 0. So the limit of k as x tends to, z to a must give us k. Let's illustrate that with a simple example. So say we have the limit of 8 as x tends to 3. The answer will simply be 8 because 3 to the power 0, this would be 8 x to the power 0. We don't write that because we know that so long as x is not 0, any other number raised to the power 0 must be 1. So 3 to the power 0 will be 1, and 1 times 8 will simply be 8. Pretty straightforward. So whenever you have to find the limit of a constant, it will be the constant itself. Nothing really changes. What about the limit of functions with powers? So let's say we have a function. And the function has a power. It's exponent something. It has an index. So for example, let's say we have f of x equals x exponent k, where k is a real number. Okay, So where k belongs to the set of real numbers r. Well, what would it look like? Well, quite simply, it would be the limit of x to the power k as x tends to a will simply be a to the power k. Simple. So all you simply do is replace x with the value that the limit is tending to. OK, that x is tending to, I beg your pardon. And that's all. So for example, if we have the limit of x to the power 5 as 3, as x approaches 3, it will simply be 3 exponent 5. And 3 exponent 5 will be 3 by 3 by 3 by 3, and then multiply by 3 five times. That will be 243. So if your limit is to a power and x is tending to an arbitrary number a, then you have a to the power k, where k is the power or the exponent. OK, in the third example, we have treated constants. We've treated functions with the powers of k, where k belongs to the set of real numbers. What if it is a product of functions? So there are two or three or four, five, six different functions together that make another function. How do we treat that? Well, pretty straightforward. So we have f of x, for example. If f of x is a product of g of x and h of x, and I hope these terminologies do not confuse you. When we say f of x, we simply mean the entire function is called f, but it depends on one input variable x. When we say g of x, it means it is another function. We call that function g, but its input function is also x. Same with h of x. So it's not really confusing. All right, we just named that function. So for example, the area of a, of a circle, we could call it a. And we say a of r because the area of a circle depends on the radius. So x is what the whole function depends on. In terms of the area of a circle, it all depends on the radius. If it was the volume of, say, um, 
a cylinder, the volume of a cylinder depends on two things. The radius of the cylinder and the height of the cylinder. So it will not depend on one thing in that case. And we'll speak about that sometime later. So if it's a product of functions, what do you do? Well, find the limits of each of the different functions and simply multiply them. Just pretty simple. So you do the same thing you would have done in the previous cases, and then you just multiply the answers you get. So for example, if we're going to find the limit of say 2x minus 1, which is say our g of x, and 4 plus x, which we, we may call h of x, so we could call all of this h of x, and we could call all of this g of x. What we simply do is to find, as x tends to 0, is to find the limit of g of x, which will give us effectively negative 1. Because if we substitute 0 here, we get 2 multiplied by 0, which will be 0, multiplied minus 1, which gives us negative 1. Then we find the limit of h of x, in which case we simply substitute again. We put 0 there, and we get 4 plus 0, which gives us 4. If we multiply negative 1 by 4, we will get negative 4. So when you have a function which is a product of two other functions, all you simply do is find the limits of each component function and then multiply the values you get in both. I, I guess this is pretty straightforward. All right, let's go to some more complicated one. Not that complicated. If you get the trick in code, uh, you have really not much to worry about. So I, I guess you are cool with this. All right. So what if we have, say, the limit of a rational function? What do you mean by a rational function? Remember rational numbers in your core math class? OK. We say a rational number is any number that can be represented as the division of any two real numbers, right? That would be a rational number. So 1 over negative 5, 3 over 2, 4 whole number. They are all rational numbers because they can be written as the division, or if you like the quotient, of two real numbers. Well, if it's a rational function, then it means that it's a division of two um, functions. So as rational functions, let's take an example. Let's say we have f of x being g of x divided by h of x. What will be the limits of such a function f of x? How do we deal with it? Well, we will simply find the limit of the numerator and find the limit of the denominator, then we divide, period. That's basically it. That's all. Now, this is with the assumption that the limit of the denominator is not 0 or both of them are not zero. If the limit of the denominator is zero, we'll have a problem. Do you remember that? Because anything, say four divided by zero, if you tried it on your calculator, it would likely give you a response saying math error. Well, it is not really an error. It simply means that the calculator is unable to give you a numerical value for that computation. 4 divided by 0 is infinite. It is really asking, how many nothings are there in 4? And there is no name for that thing. It's countless. We don't know the name for it. So the calculator will return the value math error. Really, it is called infinite. But the calculator does not give you that value because it has no numerical value. So you must, first of all, if you have a rational function and you intend to find the limits, you may have to do a little test. Check the denominator. When you do the substitution in the denominator, I beg your pardon, and you find it is zero, then it means you cannot proceed. You may have to do something else. If both numerator and denominator return a value of zero, it also means there's either no limit or you may have to do something else. What is that something else? Well, you may have to sometimes do a factorization. So for example, if you have to find the limit of a function, rational function x squared 
minus 4, all of that divided by x plus 2, where x is tending to negative 2 or approaching negative 2. If you put that value in the denominator, you would have negative 2 plus 2, that is here. It will become negative 2 plus 2. That will be 0. Now, it will mean straight away that this function, you can proceed. If you put the same negative 2 in the numerator, you have negative 2 all squared, which will be 4. And 4 minus 4 will also be 0. So you cannot simply substitute here. So there's a little thing to note here. Every time you have a rational function and you're supposed to find the limit, as far as your high school education is concerned, I want you to begin to suspect that you would have to factorize. It's almost always the case. So in this case, you notice that the numerator x squared minus 4 is a difference of two squares. You saw that, right? x squared minus 4. x squared is a square, 4 is a square. It's a perfect square. So you could find the square root of both of them, and you get x for one and 2 for the other, indeed positive or negative 2. So in expanding that or factorizing, you have x plus 2 on one hand and x minus 2 for the other factor. All of that divided by the denominator x plus 2. It would divide straight away like this. So you end up with the limit of x minus 2 as x approaches negative 2. At this point, if you did your substitution, you will have negative 2 minus 2, and your answer will be negative 4. So I hope you got this. That's limits. Now, the last limit we're going to look at, or type of limit for now, will be finding the limits as the independent variable approaches infinity. We've looked at the value of x as it approaches a, and a could be any real number we said. So it could be positive or negative integer, it could be zero, anything on real number systems. But what if the value of a becomes infinite? When we say infinite, what do we mean? We mean it becomes either very large or very small. Remember our definition of calculus? infinitesimals. We sometimes want to find out what will happen if this value gets extremely small or if it gets extremely large. What happens to the function? What will really happen? So for example, if the inflation of a country becomes very, very small and almost insignificant, what happens to purchasing power? If the growth of microbes gets really, really high. What happens to the host organism? I, I hope you're getting the trend. By the way, that is why if you are a general art student, for some of you, you take elective math because you probably study economics and geography, in which case you'll be needing this concept as you try to predict human behavior in the face of resources, limited resources actually, and competing needs. Sometimes you would need it as a business student because you want to make projections into spending and budgeting. So you need it in your accounting class. If you're a science student and you intend to do engineering, it will be your playmate every day. If you're a medical inclined person, well, you will recall that epidemiologists and um, people who are interested in finding out about how viruses and bacteria grow, you'll be interested in knowing what happens if we can limit their growth by, say, freezing or any other such scientific means. So what would be the limit of a function as it approaches infinity? Well, this is what really happens. Number one, and a few things to know, two things to know. One is that if the limit of f of x as x tends to infinity is zero. It will, it will tend to become zero so long as n is positive. It will become zero. So if we have f of x and the limit of x tends to infinity, 
it will be zero. That limit will be zero so long as the power of n is positive. If it is not positive, what would happen? Well, for example, if we have the limit of 1 on x to the power 4, straight away it will be 0 because when x is replaced with infinity or very large to the power 4, it becomes so large that 1 divided by it will be insignificant. It may as well be called 0. It's like saying 1 divided by 10. 1 divided by 10 will be 0 0.1. 1 divided by 1000 will be 0 0.01. 1 divided by 1 million will be 0 0.000001. 1 divided by a trillion, now it gets really, really small. So small that we may as well discard of it and say, hey, forget about it, that's zero, not significant anymore. All right, so if n is positive, then the limit of the function as x tends to infinity will be zero. Well, if n is positive for this case, then the function will not exist. So for example, if we say two, now remember in the first case, we had the denominator having the function x. This time around, if we simply say the limit of say two x to the power three, as x tends to infinity, well, it will not exist because it will be so large, there will be no name for it. So it will be two multiplied by infinity to the power three and infinity means so large we don't know. So 2 multiplied by x, I mean infinity to the power we don't, uh, to the power 3, will be, well, we don't know. So it, it will not exist. All right. So if the function is rational, then the limit would exist under the conditions. In this case, you would have to divide each of the terms of the function by the highest power in there. Let's take an example. So let's say we have the limit of 6x squared minus 3x plus 1, all divided by 5x squared minus 2. You notice in this case, unlike the previous case, where we could easily factor or do a factorization, we cannot do that here. But there's something curious. We notice that the highest power of x, the input value here, is x squared. So we divide each term in the numerator as well as the denominator by x squared. This is what it will look like. So x squared divided by 6x squared, I beg your pardon, divided by x squared, minus 3x divided by x squared, plus 1 divided by x squared. All of that divided by 5x squared divided by x squared, minus 2 divided by x squared. What have I done? Because the function is rational and x is tending to infinity, I am dividing each term in the numerator as well as the denominator by the highest power of x. If the highest power of x were simply x, I would have divided each by x. But the highest power in this case is x squared. So I have divided each term in the numerator as well as the denominator by x squared. When we do that, this takes itself out. Here you're left with 1, and so we have 6 minus 3 on x plus 1 on x squared, all divided by 5 minus 2 on x squared. Now remember we said that if it is this way, it will become 0, as well as this way. So we would have 6 minus 0 plus 0 divided by 5 minus 0. So we have 6 on 5 which when we break it down, we have 1.2 or one whole number, one on five. So these are the different limits you'll be dealing with. Now that we understand limits, and I hope you did, we shall move on to another basic principle of calculus. If you're just joining us, you have missed a bit. I would encourage that you go back if you are not watching on YouTube, to go back and uh, replay the previous section because the next session will depend on what we have treated so far. This is your Joy Learning Channel and this is Senior High School R, Elective Maths. My name is Danso. We shall be treating the next major heading, which is the limits 
and gradients of a curve. Let's look at this very quickly. Now, look at the diagram on your left. So on your left, we have the xy coordinate. We shall talk about the one on the right very soon. The xy coordinate. If we had a line there, for this, it will represent a function. It will be a linear function. That is why it's a line. For this linear function, we normally would be able to find a number of things for this linear function. For example, we could tell the distance between two points on the line. We could tell the inclination of the line to the x-axis and a number of things. Now, one of the things you would normally find in your coordinate geometry class is to find the gradient of this line. Now, to find the gradient of this line, we simply pick two points, as you can see on your screen, those two little dots on the line. Let's call those two points x1, y1, x2, y2. Now, if we call those two points, points A and B, so represented, then we can find the gradient of the line. Of course, we can also find the equation of the line and all of that, but that's not my interest for now. Now, why do we need to understand limits and the gradients of a curve? It's because they are connected, and watch out for the connection. The moment we have those two points, then we can tell the difference between the x-coordinates of the two different points A and B. The same will happen for the y-coordinates of the two different points. The differences in those points, now notice the word I use, differences. Those differences will represent us delta y, delta x, where delta y is change in the value of y, and delta x is change in the value of x. What is the change? y2 minus y1. Forgive when I say y2, I actually mean y subscript 2. But just so that it's not a mouthful. So y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. Of course, you can flip it the other way around. y1 minus y2, x1 minus x2. What does that give us? It gives us something you're used to. It's called the gradient. The gradient is, in description, your rise over your run. So when you're walking up a staircase, you're actually ascending vertical, but you're ascending vertical by moving horizontal. So it is your vertical divided by your horizontal. That is what you call your inclination or your gradient. So if you have a staircase that is very sharply inclined, after a few steps, you feel some tug in your thigh muscles. It means it's very steep. If it is smooth or lower, you don't really feel it. You feel cool going up and down it. So that is the gradient. Now, the gradient of a line is consistent. So whether I chose another point between A and B, which I call, say, C, the gradient of AB will be the same thing as AC. And indeed, it will be the same gradient CB. But what if it was not a line? What if it was a curve? What would happen? Okay. So we have a curve like that. Now, look at that curve again. It is not the line. We had the line before, but now we have a curve. Now, when you have a curve, it means that it is not straight. If we bring the values close together, it may look straight. And so to find the gradient of a curve, you will find out that when you treat it parabola in your core math class, the quadratic function, you had something like this, or its opposite, like that. Now, when you have this, finding the gradient is really not that easy. So, we have other ways of dealing with this. To find this gradient, you pick two arbitrary points. And when you do, in essence, the gradient of a curve or of any curve will be the gradient of the tangent to the curve. Note that definition, that it will be the gradient of the tangent, the gradient of the tangent to the curve, because you cannot really find the gradient of a curve itself. 
So we must find the gradient of the tangent at a point on the curve. If we did that, we'll have the two points P and Q, but we'll find out something, that Q is really an extension from P. So it will be X1 plus a little change in X1. And Y2 will be Y1 plus a little change in Y1. So if we had that as X1, Y1, then this new point, which we would call X2, will be a change in X1, which is delta X. And for Y, it will be a change in delta Y. So that will be our X2. And our gradient will then be the differences, which is F of X plus delta X minus F of X all divided by the change in x, which is delta x. Now, this is small letter delta. That is the capital letter. So, they mean the same thing, like this one. All right, so just as I said, y2 minus y1, this is more like saying y2, and this is like saying y1, whereas, x2 minus x1 is simply change in x, which is delta x. I hope you got that. All right, so that is it. And now, so let's go to first principles. I hope that with first principles, you should be able to navigate your way. So look at this. This is Gottfried Leibniz notation, and we have just visited it a while ago. So whenever you see this, we say that dy, and this is how we read it, dy, dx. That is how we read this one. dy dx is equal to the limit of delta y on delta x as delta x approaches zero. It is equal to that expression you see on your right. This is Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz notation. You don't need to remember the name. Just remember the formula. Leibniz was a very interesting German mathematician, and um, his contribution, as well as that of the famed English mathematician Sir Isaac Newton, gave us a revolutionary concept called calculus. Well, there's a functional notation for it where we replace the delta x with h. So you could have it this same way, but you could have, instead of dy dx, we have f prime of x. So we have f prime of x. That will be the functional notation. So we have f prime, where we have a small apostrophe just after the f. All right. Sometimes we reduce everything. So let's look at an example. And hopefully, you should be able to appreciate this quite well. So we say from first principle, Determine the derivative of f of x. What do we mean by a derivative? Like we have crude oil, and when you take crude oil through a fractional distillation, you get derivatives like premium motor spirit, you get kerosene, you get gas, you get butamine, you get tar. Those are the byproducts, so to speak, the derivatives of crude oil. In math, whenever you have a function and you try to find the gradient of the function at different points, you have what we call a derivative. It goes by other names. We could also call it the gradient function. Okay, so you could call it the derivative, the gradient function, the differential coefficient. So any of those names, derivative, differential coefficient, gradient function. They all mean the same thing. Now, from first principles, it goes this way. If f of x equals to 6x, then we're going to just introduce our equation limits. So we would all the functional notation. By the way, this x ought to be down here. Okay, forgive the typo. All right, so what do we do? We simply say 6 multiplying x plus an increase in x from this equation minus the original function, which is this. So we have minus 6x, all divided by delta x. Now, what do we do? 
we divide each part. When we divide each part, this would essentially be 6x minus 6x. That would be 0. So we end up with 6dx on dx as dx tends to 0. Now, if we divide this, it will become the limit of 6. And remember, the limit of a constant is the constant. So in this case, from first principles, the limit of 6 as delta x tends to 0 will be 6. That is first principles. Let's take a second example and see if you'd appreciate it. All right. What about 2x cubed from first principles? Let's find the derivative. We'll go through the same procedure. We'll quote Leibniz. This time around, you notice I have substituted the x with, or delta x with h. Well, that is just another way of writing it, just so that you don't have to write too many of those Greek alphabets. You can just say h, where h is the difference. All right. So this time around, I have 2 multiplying x plus the difference h, or the change h, to the power 3, minus the function 2x cubed, all divided by the difference h. Now, we have to expand x plus h to the power 3 first. And you can use any method, your normal expansion, or you can use your Pascal's triangle, or you can use your binomial theorem, whichever one suits you. When you are done, you multiply by 2. It will give us everything up to this point. So that is the expansion you get here. 2x cubed plus 6x squared h plus 6h, 6x h squared plus 2 multiplied by h to the power 3. All minus 2x cubed. Remember the formula? f of x is 2x cubed. When we have done this, you do your subtraction. This and this will neutralize each other. So you end up having... 6x squared h plus 6h x h squared plus 2h cubed all divided by h. When we divide each of, of the terms by h, the h here goes, we're left with 1 here, and at the end, instead of 2h cubed, 1 goes, so we have 2h squared. So what is the limit of that as the difference becomes almost nothing, 0? What happens? Well, we substitute wherever we find h, we put 0. When we do that, we would have... This will become 0, and this will also become 0. So we have 6 plus 0, 6x squared, sorry, plus 0 plus 0. So we end up with 6x squared. I hope you got that. So this is how we differentiate from first principles. And I hope you have followed the lesson this far. All right. We sometimes have to differentiate... Uh, trigonometric functions and I will be drawing the curtains on this so let's say we have a trigonometric function f of x equals cos x how do we find a derivative from first principles it's going to follow the same trend like we did before so we will quote Leibniz again first of all we say y is equal to cos x but this time around just so that you appreciate it why Leibniz came up with the limit of f of x is equal to f of x plus dx delta x minus f of x all divided by delta x. Why did he go through all of that? It is because what we simply do is we add. If x increases, then y should increase. Remember variation? Yeah, we said in direct variation as one increases, the other increases. So uh, we're just doing that here. So I have increased cos x by delta x and y by delta y because if x increases, y should increase or maybe decrease, whichever way. Now, if that happens, we now have a compound angle, cos of x plus delta x. You recall you had cos of a plus b being equal to cos of a, cos of b, minus sine of a, sine of b. We're just using that same principle here, in which case my x looks like a and delta x looks like b. So I use that trigonometric identity. Of course, there are others you could use. I am choosing this because I think you are more comfortable with this one. 
because I believe so. Well, if we did that, you would have cos x delta x minus sin x delta x. Well, we want to find the limits of delta y on delta x. So I need to make delta y the subject. So I will subtract y from both sides. If I did that, remember y is cos x. So I will have minus y, which is minus cos x. Now, if I did that, I could also decide to now divide through by delta x. Why? Because I want to find that. That's my aim. If I did that division, a number of things will happen. Now, there are certain identities you should know, and I cannot prove it to you now because it is um, something you can test on your own. Generally, sine of x divided by x should give you 1 and cosine of x on x should give you 0. I want you to try this. By the way, note that x should always be in radians. x should always be in radians, not degrees, radians, for this to be true. So try a value of x, say 5. And say sine 5 in radians divided by 5. You would notice sine 4 divided by 4, sine 3 divided by 3 will always give you 1. If you did the same thing for cosine, you should end up with 0. So it would mean that in this case, you would have 0. So it would be cosine of 0. Here, you would have 1. Here, it would not even represent at all. So we would end up having something like this that would be equal to cos x multiplied by 0 minus sine x multiplied by 1. Cos x multiplied by 0 will automatically be 0, and you would end up with dy dx being the limit of delta y on delta x as delta x tends to 0, becoming equal to negative sine x. I hope you got this right. On this note, I want to say thank you very much for your attention. I believe you have been able to pick a lesson or two from calculus. You now know what limits are, and you know how to use the limits to determine the derivative or the differential coefficient, or if you like, the gradient of a curve. And from first principles, you can determine the derivative of any function, including a trigonometric function. I hope to catch you next time, and next time we'll bring you the general rules related to functions. I hope that by that time, you can work your way around all of this and appreciate it some more. I hope to see you next time. Until then, keep learning. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.